so thank you all for coming. Uh, just quite a crowd. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to be talking a little bit today about uh, data logging and visualization. My name is Jonah. I am the student software lead for Team 6328 from Littleton, Massachusetts. OK, so excuse me. Uh, just to start off at a, a high level, so we're going to be talking about uh, how we can look at logging in FRC at a high level, different levels of that, and a few specific tools that we can use for that. So WPILib, Advantage Scope, and Advantage Kit. And then we have a few case studies that we're going to talk about to see how this, how this works in action. And at the end, hopefully, we have some time for questions as well. Okay. So I want to start off by just breaking down what logging can even look like in FRC, because there's a, a wide variety. Um, and I generally like to break it down into these three categories. So driver station logging, onboard robot logging, and log replay. So let's talk about each one in a little bit more detail. So driver station logging, level one logging, this is the simplest form of logging. It's built right into the driver station. Most of you are probably familiar with it. And it's nice because it works automatically, no setup required. Um, we can record simple data with it, battery voltage, current draw, uh, console text, network diagnostics. And so this is really good for simple issues. So for example, motor is unplugged, the code crashes, that sort of thing. But, it's, but you quickly run into a limit with what's possible just using the driver station. Um, so the next level up is onboard robot logging. So this can look like a variety of different things, typically recording data from the code onto a USB drive. I would also, uh, as part of level two logging, include anything where we're streaming data over the network. So, so you can view values live, you can see what's going on in real time. There are a lot of options for how to achieve this. WPILib currently has a very nice solution for uh, recording data to a log file, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. In general, this is a little bit more effort to set up, but it is far more flexible than just level one logging. There is a lot that can be achieved with this level two onboard logging. The one downside is that there is a risk that in all of that data you're gathering, as you're trying to debug an issue, you miss out on that one field that you actually really need, which can be super frustrating. Generally, you just have to be really, really um, careful about logging as many fields as you can. However, Level three logging, advantage kit logging, is, uh, is trying to address that final flaw of uh, onboard logging. You might also hear this called a log everything approach, which uh, you'll understand why when we talk about this. Um, the objective of level three logging is that the full internal state of the code can be accessed based on the log, which means there is never a risk of not logging a field that you need. Um, because you can always go back and inspect the code in more detail. This is definitely more complex to implement than level two. Um, and there are several tools that are able to achieve this. So some of them are not actually uh, designed for FRC. You might be familiar with ROS, for example, is a, a way to do this. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to be particularly talking about Advantage Kit, which is 6328's library for level three logging. OK. Before we get to that, I want to start with level two logging. This is, um, so if you're just using driver station logging right now, this is something that I cannot recommend enough that you start looking at at this next step of onboard logging. Um, WPILib, their recommended approach for doing this is that you can log data to network tables like you might already be familiar with, and, you, and then you can additionally save all of that data to a log file. These tools are built right into WPILib, so it's incredibly easy to get started. You can see here, we, I have a little bit, a, a tiny code snippet that shows how to do this. Literally, if you add this one line of code to your robot init, you can begin writing all of your network tables data to a log file. We can also, this next line will capture joystick data. We'll see an example of why that might be useful later. And then you can just make a call like this that, that you may already be using. And all of that data will get into, will be stored in your log file. There are more complex ways to implement this that come with their own benefits, but literally the simplest way you can get started is just three lines. Um, WPILIP has very good documentation on this, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it. Um, on the WPILIP docs, the telemetry and data logging docs are very thorough. Okay. 
Now, in terms of viewing the data, that's the other really important half of this, um, there are a couple of tools that are included already. The primary dashboards that are useful for live logging are Shuffleboard, which uh, of course is primarily designed for on-field use. Glass is an alternative that's mostly designed for programmers. And FRC Web Components is a third-party option that's becoming very uh, useful here. For historical analysis, WPI Lib's built-in tools are a little more sparse. So the data log tool is built in, which allows you to download log files from the Rio, convert them to a CSV format. That's very useful, but it doesn't do uh, any more complex visualization. Right now, there aren't any other official tools for historical data analysis. However, that leads very nicely into the, net, into the next tool I'd like to introduce, Advantage Scope. Advantage Scope is an application that was developed by 6328 for log analysis. We began developing this in 2021 and then made some big improvements for 2022 with support for more formats and visualizations. You can see a few of the key features there. The first thing I want to note about Advantage Scope is that it's compatible with all three levels of logging that I've talked about. We can open driver station logs. Um, in general, we prefer Advantage Scope's interface to the built-in driver station log viewer. You can open WPI logs uh, with Advantage Scope, connect to network tables, and Advantage Kit logs are also supported for level three logging. Advantage Scope also supports both historical and live logging in the same application, so you can seamlessly switch between them. And among all of the tools available, it's the only one that uh, supports that out of the box. There are a whole bunch of visualization tools that Advantage Scope includes. We'll talk about as many of them as we get to, as we can get to. There are uh, some basic views you can see, so a line graph, a table view, but there are also more complex options, like a 3D field visualization, joystick view, uh, swerve visualization, etc. And many of these views can also be combined for even more, uh, for even deeper analysis. Okay. With uh, a bunch of the background out of the way, I want to take a look at a couple of case studies so you can see some, how, the, how these tools are actually useful in practice. The first one is for tuning an arm. And just for a little bit of context here, so this is 6328's 2023 robot, Banana Split. In essence, it's a triple jointed arm. So there's a shoulder, elbow, and wrist joint, and a cube intake on the front, which pivots down. All of those arm joints are controlled via feed forward model and a PID controller. And of course, that PID controller needs to be tuned. So let's look at how advantage scope and logging can help with this. Everything that we're going to look at here is possible with only level two logging. So we aren't talking about advantage kit or level three just yet. Here we have a log file from one of our previous events. So what I'm going to do is just drag out the uh, measured and set point values for our elbow joint, just like that. I'll zoom in to where to our match here. And you can see also along the bottom, I've included where the robot is enabled and disabled. Now, the units here are radians, so we can use Advantage Scope's built-in unit conversion feature to turn that into degrees. Radians may be very nice for the math, but they are very uh, unpleasant for humans, so um, degrees are often much easier to work with. Okay, and now just based on the graph, we can see that the measured angle is tracking the set point pretty well. But this is a really hard thing to visualize in terms of what the triple jointed arm is doing, right? So let's take a look at a different tool. We can log the full state of the arm using WPI Lib's Mechanism 2D object. Uh, it's built right in, you may, might already have used it. But with Advantage Scope, we can view that data based on a log file. So here, what I'm gonna do is make a new tab, new visualization for mechanism data we're logging the measured and set point positions. So I'm going to drag those two out. And we can see the mechanism uh, in 2D, the full arm. Then hit play. And we're now replaying in real time what was happening in auto. And note that here, we actually have two separate mechanism 2D objects that we're able to combine in the log file to analyze how well we're tracking. Now, this is fine. This is useful. But it's still a little bit abstract, right? It's just lines. So here, let's switch to my, my very favorite Advantage Scope view, which is the 3D field. Advantage Scope has a feature that allows you to import your robot CAD for visualization. So here, we're looking at the exact same data, but projected onto the real robot model. So we can see how the real robot is moving relative to the set point. So this makes it much easier to visualize uh, everything that's going on. 
And remember, Advantage Group can also connect over network tables. So if we were running driver practice, for example, we could connect and see this same visualization live, uh, see whether we're tracking the set point correctly. Okay, one last visualization. Advantage Scope has a statistics feature. So if we drag out the measured and set point angle, it can automatically calculate the error between those for us and visualize it in a histogram. So we can see, for example, that the mean, radi that the mean error is 0.25 radians, which is a degree and a half, which seems pretty good. The 99th percentile is 0.121 radians, which is about seven degrees. So maybe that could be a little better. Um, and of course, we could dig more deeply into all of this data given the time, but for, for now, let's move on. Okay, here's another area where logging is really, really important because it's hard to visualize what's going on just looking at the robot. Um, any sort of vision processing, it is, it is essential to be able to debug after a match if something went wrong. Okay, and again, for context, the banana split has four cameras powered by four orange pies, which it's using for April tag. Uh, visual for April tag tracking. And all of that is, data is being logged on the Rio. We are using a custom solution, but it's essentially equivalent to limelight or photon vision that you might, uh, might be using. Okay. Here I've switched to a bird's eye view of the field instead of uh, relative to the robot. And I'm gonna drag out now a couple of fields that indicate the uh, measured positions based on the April tags and the positions of all of the tags that the robot is actively tracking. Then we're going to replay in real time uh, and see what's going on. So here this is auto again from one of our previous matches. We're tracking several tags and you can see in 3D where the robot thinks it is versus where, it, uh, where the tags say that it actually is. This is something that after every match, we'll review data like this so we can go through the match, we can speed up, for example, make it, uh, make it take a little less time to review. Um, and we always wanna keep an eye out for times that something might have gone wrong, we can always debug based on this data. And again, all of this can be viewed live over the network. So when we're doing driver practice, we're always looking at views like this, trying to make sure everything is going right. We also don't need to, to stick to a bird's eye view, that's a little boring. So instead, let's uh, recreate the video from each of our four cameras. So Advantage Group knows the positions of the cameras, and it can move, a, uh, and it can change the views, render the views as the cameras would have seen them. So here, these are our four cameras. This is super useful if we need to debug, uh, for example, which cameras we expect to be seeing tags versus which ones are actually seeing tags. With the mechanism data. Uh, that we saw earlier, we can even visualize when part of the robot might be occluding one of the tags. So super useful for debugging. Okay, now a lot of this actually would be possible in 2D, right, in terms of debugging mechanisms and whatnot, but localization with April tags is fundamentally three-dimensional. So this is one use case where the 3D visualization is essential, is required. Um, so this was a particular incident at one of our previous events. What you're looking at here is just a visualization of the pure uh, April tag pose estimates, so no gyro or anything. So the robot will come in. Oops, <laughs> it, it was an unfortunate moment there. Um, but we can confirm that even through all of this motion, we're actively tracking tags and making a 3D pose estimate, and that estimate is accurate. So this is a really good confirmation by seeing the 3D data that our calibration is right, our cameras are right, and everything is working to plan. Okay, shifting directions a little bit, let's talk about driver error, because this data isn't just useful for programmers, it can also benefit the drivers. Um, we're gonna move back a year here to 2022, and I've combined a couple of useful views. So on the left, this is the match video, which Advantage Group has tools that allow you to synchronize to a log file, on the right is a, a visualization of what the drivers were doing on the joysticks. So um, we talked about earlier that joystick data can be logged automatically by WPILib. This is where that really comes in handy. Uh, and as the match plays, we can see what the drivers are doing moment to moment. There are a lot of times that the robot might do something unexpected, and it's really important to nail down, was that the code messing up, some problem with the code, or did the drivers push the wrong button, as happens from time to time. Um, and being able to go back and visualize this makes it really easy to figure out um, how we need to address the problem. Okay, 
I've now focused in on a moment near the end of the match and turned to 25% speed so we can see this more clearly. Our robot is just in front trying to run back to the hangar. And there's the cable bump right there. Oops. Again, we tip over. Um, and it's really useful in a moment like this to be able to go back to a log and see, uh, for example, in this case, the driver is holding backwards and they're still holding backwards and then they release just as we go over the bump. So the rest of the robot keeps moving and the robot tips over. That's something that if you weren't looking at the log data, it would be really hard to figure out what happened, what can we do better. But seeing that data, the driver will know, of course, not to do that again, right? Um, it, it's really useful for that sort of review. Okay. So those were a few examples of level two. I want to move on to what's possible with level three logging. Uh, and specifically, again, this is with AdvantageKit, which is our library that we've built for this. To understand level three logging, we, we need to simplify our view of the robot code. So most, at, at its most fundamental level, the robot code is reading a set of inputs and it's producing a set of outputs. So inputs would be things like encoder values, joystick buttons, uh, joystick, um, whether the robot is enabled, and any other sensors. The robot code has a bunch of internal logic, so those are your, your subsystems, your commands, your auto routines, and it produces outputs, so things like motor voltages, pneumatic commands, the odometry pose, or a flywheel set point. Note that we would generally consider something like odometry pose to be an output, specifically because it's calculated based on inputs, based on sensors, even though it's, we're not directly commanding any motors with it. Here's what level two logging uh, looks like. There we go. So we might select a few useful input values and output log, uh, values and store those in a log file. Of course, if we didn't store a field in the log, we can't use it for debugging. So to fix this, here's what level three logging looks like. Let's break down each part of this. Instead of just logging a few fields, what we're now doing is we're logging every single input field. This is really important. Any data that the code uses needs to be logged regardless of the source of that data. But why? Well, if we run the robot code again, but in a simulator, and feed it the inputs from the log file, the code will do exactly the same thing as it did on the real robot. That's kind of a wild idea, so feel free to take a moment to wrap your head around that. If the same code is receiving the same input in the same order, it will always produce the same output. What that means is that we can measure all of our outputs from the simulated code, and we are guaranteed that those outputs are the same as they were on the real robot. We can even adjust the robot code if we want and produce more outputs than the first time, like data we forgot to include in the log file. We can always retrieve it just by running the code in simulation. Now, that's all good in theory, but let's talk about how that changes the robot code. AdvantageKit, in order to, to achieve this, needs to be able to log and replay all of the code's input data. There's a lot of that data that's managed automatically by AdvantageKit, like robot state, joystick data, Rio status, power distribution data. And it's also worth noted, noting that in this list I've included timestamps. AdvantageKit needs to guarantee that all of the timestamps read during a single cycle are identical so that they can be replayed accurately. AdvantageKit produces what we call timestamp synchronized logs, which means that all of the fields are updated once per loop cycle, and each loop cycle has a single timestamp. Now, in order to guarantee that all of the data going to the robot code is the same as the data going to the log, AdvantageKit shims several WPI lib classes to make this work, which means we've replaced several classes. The other side of this, of course, is that there are subsystems which are reading data from motors and sensors and whatnot. This is the biggest difference, biggest structural change that AdvantageKit introduces to the robot code. The subsystem logic needs to be separated from the hardware interface, which we call the I.O. layer. So in this case, we have a flywheel subsystem, which might run PID controllers, check when the flywheel reaches its set point, calculate the correct speed based on distance, those sorts of things. And then we have an I.O. interface, which is literally a Java interface, and that defines all of the input data. So say the flywheel velocity and position. And it has methods for setting outputs, like commanding a voltage. We then write an implementation that talks to the hardware, like a Spark Max controller. When running on the robot, AdvantageKit records all of the data from the I.O. layer and all of the outputs get set, 
sent to the Spark Max. But here's the fun bit. When we're running a log replay, we can simply disable the IO implementation and Advantage Kit will replay all of the input data from the log file. So to the rest of the robot code, it looks exactly like we were running with hardware, except the data is coming from Advantage Kit. Another neat thing that we can do with this structure is that we can actually write multiple hardware implementations, multiple versions of the I.O. layer. Like we could have a simulated implementation that uses uh, WPI Lib's physics sim classes to produce what it estimates the position and velocity would be. We could even have, say, flywheel I.O. Talon FX implementation if we had a practice robot with slightly different hardware. And that doesn't change any of the rest of the code. The subsystem logic can remain exactly the same. Okay, I have a couple more case studies to talk about. And these, so this is specifically for Advantage Kit. And these case studies are mostly based on our 2022 robot, which was BotBot Awakens. So this was a West Coast drive, uh, no turret. And on the top, there is a uh, limelight for tracking the goal, for tracking the upper hub. Okay. This is a, first a really simple example if we want to use log replay to generate extra outputs from a file. We'll start by looking at one of our log files from the 2022 championship last year. So I'm just going to open up the log file there. As soon as that loads, I'll drag out the field for whether the robot is enabled, put that along the bottom. The flywheel goal RPM, which is basically the set point, uh, in there. So we can see across the whole match there are our goal RPM going up and down. Now, theoretically, the way this is meant to work is that the, based on the distance to the target, the flywheel speed will be automatically calculated, so it will go faster if you're farther away. But if we wanted to check that that system is working, it's, it's tricky. It seems like we forgot to log the distance to the target. So we have no way of debugging that, except through log replay. Because all of the inputs are logged, the encoder values, gyro values, vision data, we can replay the code and extract that extra field that we forgot to log the first time. Okay. So let's return to this diagram for a moment. We said before that the simulated robot code will behave exactly the same as the original robot code, given the same inputs. But there is another caveat, which is that the two copies of the robot code need to be completely identical for that to work. The log we were just looking at was from early in the year, last year, and our 2022 robot code changed during the off-season, so the replay wouldn't work with the current version of the code. But luckily, all of our robot code is checked into version control with Git and GitHub. Each commit can be uniquely identified based on its hash, which allows us to find a specific version of the code. Of course, commits don't include any uncommitted changes that we might have made during the event and deployed to the robot. So we run a separate system for competitions where it's critical to be able to replay every single match. We created a VS Code extension, so every time we deploy to the robot, we automatically generate a commit. Those are all on a separate branch, so there's an example from the championship. There are many, many commits. So they're all on a separate branch that we can eventually squash and merge back to main so we don't clutter up our history. And the result of all of this effort is it means that any code that we've ever run in a competition, we know exactly what we were running. Even if we were actively tuning things, tweaking values, we know what was running in every match. Okay, let's return to the log file. Now, Advantage Kit it can record metadata in the log file. And one of the key fields we include is the, git, uh, the commit hash right there. You can see also just above, it says all changes committed. So that, if we go back to that commit, we're running the exact version of code that was on the robot. Okay, let's do the replay then. So this is our 2022 robot code, open in VS Code. What I'm gonna do is add a line there to record the distance to the target in meters. I'm gonna run git checkout with the commit hash we used earlier, and then launch the simulator. Now Advantage Kit will look at whatever the last log file we had open in Advantage Scope was. It'll pull that just a moment. And then it'll begin, begin replaying the code. Now it's doing this, it's running cycles as fast as my laptop can handle them, rather than every 20 milliseconds. Remember the timestamp is injected by Advantage Kit anyway, so there's nothing stopping us from just telling it that time is moving, fa moving slower than it actually is. In this case we're running about 50 times faster than real time in simulation. Advantage Kit then generates a log file which includes all of the original inputs plus the new simulated replayed outputs. 
And here, uh, back in Advantage Scope, we can open up that replayed log file. Just a minute. There we go. Um, once that opens, we'll see there's a new, in addition to real outputs, there's a new table for replay outputs. And right there is the new field that we just logged. So drag that over. And we can see that uh, it's the flywheel interpolation, the, the speed model, seems to be working pretty well. So as the distance increases, our flywheel speed increases. And we can guarantee we can look at that data and know that the, that the system is working correctly, even though we're using data that we never logged the first time. This is all just based on the inputs that were logged um, during the match. OK. That's a really simple example. but. Let's look at something a little more complicated by returning to the example of uh, vision data. So last year we were trying to update our odometry based on seeing the upper hub. So that's a little less reliable than April tags, but it, it does come in handy for um, scoring. We'll go back to the 3D field here. And um, let's see. So the robot will we'll drag out the robot. This is a model from BotBot Awakens look at the vision target, and then as we're driving around, you can see whenever we're pointed towards the hub, we're attempting to reset our odometry. And the estimated poses there are, are jumping around a little bit. There's a fairly complex pipeline involved in this in order to filter out invalid targets and calculate our pose. So it's really important that we can go back and debug that, that pipeline, because there are a lot of steps as part of it. We can also, if, if it's useful for debugging, uh, as you might out here, and switch to a static view like before. So this is what the limelight was seeing. We can check uh, what the limelight should, should theoretically have been seeing when the target was supposed to be in view. And this match here that we've been looking at is an example of the pipeline working really well. But uh, it doesn't always do that. So here, this is a log file from an off-season event where the limelight was picking up some spurious targets. So let's take a look. Oops. Yeah, that's not all that realistic. Um, so the limelight is, is seeing some targets that are not correct, we're getting pose estimates that are wrong, uh, and so we really want to debug what's going on there. This is a, a slightly different view in Advantage Scope, so we can dig a little bit deeper. On the left there is the raw data from the limelight. So those are the corners that it was picking up. On the, the upper right is what it should be seeing. So compared to the view from the limelight, you can see it's identifying the corners of all of the pieces of retroreflective tape around the hub. Uh, and on the left, it's not doing that so well. Um, so how can, we fix, how can we fix that? Well, let's, u let's use a, a slightly different view in Advantage Group. This is, this is the table view. And what we're looking at is the set of x coordinates that were logged for all of the corners. And in this particular instance, we can see that there are 13 corners listed. Um, we're looking for rectangular pieces of tape, so we should always expect the number of corners to be uh, a multiple of four. Okay, let's see if we can fix that then. Like before, we'll use the commit hash to return to this exact version of the code, but instead of logging extra data, we'll add a couple of lines to improve the filtering. So in this case, we're just checking that the number of corners is divisible by four, and there are the same number of uh, x and y coordinates. Okay. Now we'll run the code in replay as before, just as you saw. And this time, though, we're expecting the code's outputs to be different than they were on the real robot to be improved. Let's take a look. This is the same clip as before, with the green robot representing the new replayed odometry pose. The solid robot is the original log data. So we drive out from the, from the hangar. And there we go. So the replayed, log, replayed pose stays in the correct location. And once we turn towards the target, the two poses converge again. So it looks like this code is working pretty well. And the nice thing about Advantage Kit is we can now run this code in future matches with complete confidence that it will work correctly. We didn't need to go to a practice field and test this. We know that if we were running this code in the real match, it would have been objectively a better option. Um, so this really helps in terms of being able to make rapid iterations uh, on the field or uh, between matches. Okay, now just to wrap up, I want to take, go back to these three levels of logging that we discussed earlier. So we've now looked at several examples of what logging can look like at, at these levels. And for anyone, important, anyone looking at improving your own team's logging, I think it's really important that you uh, evaluate your own skill level and your own priorities. 
So in general, I would highly recommend that most teams should at least be looking at level two locking. As I showed, you can get started with this with just a couple of lines of code, and the benefits of level two logging are enormous. Um, a huge amount is possible with just WPILib's built-in frameworks, and level two logging really does make debugging almost anything easier, especially for beginners. Whether to take on level three logging is a more complex question. Uh, it, it, implementing Advantage Kit in particular definitely increases the code complexity, but it also brings huge benefits. Frankly, most teams can do everything that they need with logging at level two, but if you're looking for more of a challenge and you're running into the limits of what's possible at, at level two, then taking that next step might make sense. Um, in general, I would also recommend if you're interested in level three logging, this is definitely something to look at uh, as an off-season project as opposed to in the, the middle of competition season. Um, okay, so that about wraps up uh, everything I want to say. Uh, and we have, I think, about five minutes for questions.